It is Locked On Jazz for the 25th of October. The Jazz come home from a super fun road trip. We learn a lot about what Will Hardy thinks about the team with three really interesting comments and the way he's using the players. Simone Foncecchio gets discovered and the players are trying to add layers. We're talking about it all coming up on Locked On Jazz. Bum 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 pow. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. How are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider. This is Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thank you so much for tuning in and making Locked on Jazz your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all podcasting platforms and apps, and whatever you get your podcast. We're also on YouTube, and today we are live on YouTube with a rare live show. I'll I'll probably be doing this a little bit more when we get back from a road trip. Um, For me to be able to try to get a workout in and do things, I've got to push the timing of the show back. Sorry, we are dealing with our audio stuff, and I actually think I have it mastered. I just had to change change the level there. I think after a week of... Pure audio disasters, I have finally figured this out. So Keith, Scott, Lacey, Tamor, Ben, thank you so much for tuning in. Holly Rowe has been actually super helpful to me on all of this, trying to help me figure it all out. Um, And we talked about on the plane for a long time, so thank you. Um, Turns out there was a double feed and the drivers, for whatever reason, my computer kicked out the drivers. Um, I don't know why, but they did. So that's... That's what, that's what happened, um, and now we got to find new audio levels, and I think we got it. All right, uh, what a fun week that was. Uh, little three games, four nights, three cities, Beat start the year by beating three Western Conference playoff teams, um, and then the last lo- loss last night to the Rockets um, don't, d- didn't seem to... It didn't seem to really bother me, I, frankly. I think I saw that one coming. I was talking to Craig Ackerman before the game, you know, that we had just exerted an awful lot of energy um, in the last few games. And so it's not surprising to me that that the team fell a little short um, energy-wise on stuff. I, I think that they really were running in mud. Uh, I think you had Lowry Markinen particularly running in mud. And that's, we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about the layers the layers that these guys have got to add to their game is is the story to me. That's the story of our whole season, is each of our guys learning how to add layers to their game to become a little bit better player, and then we discover as a franchise where they fit in our futures. And I think, you know, we're just seeing that. And each of these guys is going to be asked, and Lowry's being asked to do an awful lot. And so I think that was... We saw last night. There were a few comments this week that I I really, really, really wanted to highlight and talk about. I think I talked about some of them yesterday, but Will Hardy just has kind of maybe the confidence of a three-game win streak. He's beginning to share a little bit about what he thinks of this team. Um, You know, the telling is most telling comment of the week of the trip, as I just kind of recap the trip, was the the comment he made um, at, at the excuse me, woo. After the overtime game in New Orleans, I'll try to edit that out. Um, can't edit out a live show, though, I guess. Um, ah, the problem's going live. Uh, was, we have heart. And I, I just, you know what? It's kind of what every Jazz fan's asked for and wanted and hoped for and 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 was trying to get and and has gotten, is that this team has heart. And that's that's exactly, I think, what every single one of us wanted to see. Uh, and maybe after, and particularly, you know, it's often a comparison to last year, um, where a team and really for the last few years didn't, didn't have the fight that we've seen the last few nights. And that's, that's kind of awesome. Uh, The other one I thought was just the most interesting comment. I know I've mentioned this a few times. And if you're, you know, like some of the people, Lacey and others who listen every day, you're like, again, Locke, but I I just think it was such an interesting comment. And, And, and the, and the comment was by Will Hardy about how his concern, and there's so many layers to this comment is why I think it's so interesting. 
is the concern that he had going into training camp that there was this much open playing time and that the training camp would end up being not a productive competitiveness, but a nasty competitiveness and almost like a dogfight and a fight for um, playing time that led to, you know, literally fights, right? Like, and, and division of the team. And that instead the team has done the opposite, that they've bonded together. So here's why I think this is such an interesting comment. One is it's really revealing of, of, of something we hear a lot about. People like to talk about how smart people are all the time. Oh, he's so smart. Yeah, like, like what does that really mean? Like, so we've heard that an awful lot about Will Hardy. That Will Hardy um, is super, super smart. Well, this to me is an example of that. That's a pretty, as a young coach, looking at your roster, getting ready for training camp, to be thinking like, oh, we have so much open playing time that this camp could get nasty. That's really what he was thinking. And that, that clearly that was addressed in a manner that somehow bonded the team together. These are the coaching things that are frankly way more important than whether he goes to Simone Fonchecchio and Nikhil Alexander-Walker on a night where the Jazz are dead last night to try to find more pieces. Like I think that's truly... Like there's more to it than like that's where the coaching actually happens. So I thought that was I thought that was super insightful um, into who Will Hardy is. The other thing is is it's insightful to I think I'm guessing here to what Mike Conley and Jordan Clarkson have done for this team. We talked about their leadership yesterday on the the four plays, and actually it was interesting. I asked Will Hardy about those two plays yesterday, and then he brought up the play Thurl Bailey talked about with Lowry Markinen. Um, which we talked about in yesterday's show. So either Will Hardy is listening to Locked on Jazz, which I think is unlikely, and he added in just as a way to signal me that he listened to Locked on Jazz, which I didn't pick up on because I didn't actually believe it to be true. Um, he didn't. Um, or we were on yesterday, and w- really thorough was. I just listened to thorough a lot. So the other one I think is some sort of leadership from the players had to go on inside this team to allow for, and I'd love to say it's Kelly Linick, but he wasn't here because he came super late. Maybe, maybe it is Kelly Linick at the training camp, but I, I'm guessing this might have started earlier. And I think the fact that Mike and Jordan came into this year taking it seriously and not just, oh, well, I'm going to get traded. It doesn't matter. We've cut, none of you guys matter. This all sucks. They didn't do that. They actually have taken ownership of this team and the opportunity to lead this team. Mike's being a more vocal leader than he was a year ago. I thought was, I think that's really interesting. The other one I thought was, I asked Will about their close games and and how well they're, how well they're finishing their close games this year. And he said, Hey, we've got Mike Conley, a 15 year veteran. We got Jordan on the floor. We got Kelly Olynyk, we got Lowry Market, and we got Jared Vanderbilt on the floor, or we've got some combination. And, you know, we're not playing young guys and closing young games. We don't have that one marquee player that you can go to late in a game that, you know, a former number two pick, or, well, I guess Mike's number three, but at this point in his career, um, you know, that type of player, the Luka Doncic, the Giannis Adetokounmpo, or he needs Chris Middleton, you know, we don't have that guy. And so they're collectively, we're seeing it. And maybe the best example of all of that is that last play where you throw the ball to a Linux and then he's either reading Mike and reading. And I talked to Kelly about it. Kelly, last night in the locker room, and Kelly said that, you know, he was really looking at Lowry. He just couldn't see an advantage given to Lowry. He didn't know that C.J. McCollum was on him. He knew that they had switched. He knew that Larry Nance had left to go to the corner um, and either to follow Mike Conley or to go somewhere else. He could feel that Larry Nance had left him, so he knew he no longer had a center on him. He couldn't really see the advantage of turning it over to um, Lowry at that point, and so he made the turn, and that's when he saw that C.J. McCollum was on him. C.J. had done a really nice job um, to make that switch, frankly, uh, and, and to get there. So I think, you know, interesting insight. I had a really, really good conversation with Kelly Linick and, uh, and Abaji in the um, locker room last night. I'll share, so I don't have it in my notes. Um, I will quickly move it to my notes because I, I thought Kelly was really interesting about some things. So I'll share, I'll share that with you in, in a moment. Um, so the other one I thought that was, so was that, and then the last one is that the number one word that, that Will Hardy's used all, all training camp and all time is versatility. 
And we're seeing him use that versatility. And even that, like, okay, so he's going to Kelly Olenek on a go-to play to use that versatility to flip it. That, that play is really symbolic of a lot. He's gone to Lowry Markkinen as the go-to guy versatility. He's run, you know, Jordan Clarkson on this. He closed with Malik Beasley one game, Colin Sexton another and another. He's had a different closing lineup in all three of our close games. So that versatility, he went to... This, I, I've said that the standard deviation from our best player, probably Lowry Markkinen, to our 12th or 13th best player, I don't know, maybe let's go 12. We've seen 12 play, Nikhil Alexander-Walker. Like, it's pretty slim. Like, our standard deviation, 1 through 12, is pretty slim. We saw that last night when um, he went to Nikhil Alexander-Walker and Simone Foncecchio. So I, I think those were, to me, those were the three biggest takeaways Um so far from kind of comments that Will Hardy's made. The last one I'll, I'll talk about coming up here in a second is he, he talked yesterday and we'll, I'll try to pull these cuts for tomorrow because I thought it was really interesting about environment. And we're learning a little bit of his coaching philosophy um, that he shared before the game last night about his environment. I, and, and we'll really touch on that tomorrow. Um, I want to make one note. I made a mistake last night on the postcast, I think, uh, or, I, I I made a mistake. Let's just go with that. Um, I thought Colin Sexton gotten taken out of the game because they weren't pushing the tempo enough when he was at point guard and Will had really been egging him on to get going and he went to Nikhil Alexander-Walker. It was also Colin Sexton's first time playing a back-to-back since the meniscus surgery and I forgot that. Sorry. Um, should have remembered it. Probably a good case of where these guys are all a little new to us and we don't remember their stories. So that was my mistake. Um, and I think that there could have been that Colin Sexton got taken out just to manage minutes um, last night. Um, he is not a natural point guard. I, I am now referring to the Taylor Horton Tucker, Colin Sexton comeback as our running backs. And what I mean by that is that Colin Sexton is the tailback and Taylor Horton Tucker is the fullback. But running backs don't fumble. Um, they're, neither of their instincts is to pass. We'll see. That's the layer that they need to add. We'll talk more about layers and adding layers. I'll get some of your comments as well. The live show here today, um, a little bit later than usual. Uh, thanks so much for listening to Locked On Jazz today as your first listen. Locked On Sports Today should be your second listen each and every day. It is a 22-minute recap of all things going on in uh, the world of sports. It is just a fabulous program. I have not heard it today and I'm really missing it and wish that I had. So make sure you grab uh, Locked On Sports today each and every day uh, here on uh, as your second listen, your 22-minute program on that. All right. Uh, today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Murdoch Hyundai located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. I now own three Hyundais. So this is not some just bull crap. I have a script in front of me. I actually don't have a script in front of me. You can probably tell. Um, what this is, is I actually met the Murdochs, got to know Blake really well, enjoy Ben and Tyson, but really have gotten to know Blake well. Really impressed by the family. Did my research about Hyundai, was interested, did the sponsorships with them, felt really good about the Murdochs at that point. Did my research when we had to buy a car and realized I got more dollar, more bang for the buck by buying a Hyundai than any other car out on the market. I, 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 I tell you what, I'm driving the Hyundai Elantra, no, I'm driving the Sonata right now, which is the nicest of their sedans. I, I can't imagine if you're buying a sedan why, why you'd spend an extra $25,000 or something else. That car has everything you'd ever need, plus bells, plus whistles. I hit the turning signal to go to one side and actually the camera comes up in my dash. I don't ever have to take my eyes off the road. It's just great. So we own two Santa Fe's and we own the new electric Ionic. Why? Because the research I did showed that those were the best dollar I could get or best car I could get for my dollar. You do your own research. If you come back, I just strongly suggest you at least test drive a Hyundai. If you're in the market for a car, even if if it's one of those sporty little name cars or just a, you know, test drive a Hyundai and make sure that it's not the right answer for you. And I'll set you up with a VIP meeting in any of the locations in Logan, in Linden, or in Murray. Feel free to email me first at dlock09 at gmail.com. That's dlock09 at gmail.com. Today's show is also brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn, the uh, 
in the job market for you, doing everything you need and trying to make sure that you, um, sorry, I'm trying to get my little LinkedIn graphic up. There we go. There's LinkedIn. Um, the uh, job market right now, you've got to do it as fast and furious as you possibly can. And that's what LinkedIn is there to do for you and help you out um, in every way you can imagine. They do wonderful work. Um, by making sure that they get your hiring done faster than anywhere else. 100% certain you'll have access to the best qualified candidates. And that's why you got to check on LinkedIn Jobs. It helps find the right people for your team faster and free. The job market is nuts right now. And you've just, you could end up just going one after another after another. So simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates. The right skills, the experience, quick prioritizing who to hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs the number one in delivering quality hire and leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want talk to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNBA. That's LinkedIn.com slash LockedOnNBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Chat room is open as we are live today. Fun to have a live show. Um, going on. So feel free to um, get your thoughts out there. I'll try to follow up with them as well. Um, uh, Foncecchio was fun Checchio last night, says Lacey. Um, has, uh, Foncecchio has also played as a shooting guard in the past. Um, I, you know, I'm not, we'll, we'll get, um, I, I'm not sure um, that I, I don't think, uh, Foncecchio was great last night. I don't know where the minutes are coming from. We'll see um, what's happening. Uh, Sam wants to know uh, if we've already talked about it. What do you think it would take to get a Baji into the rotation? So a few things here. I think that what you're going to see is kind of progression over time, right? So if you think about like 10 game stretches, um, Horton Tucker's got a spot right now. Malik Beasley's got a spot right now. Those are probably Abaji spots. Um, he's he's a two or a three, depending on how you're using him. He's not, I, I have not seen on his Kansas tape, and I have not seen in the limited training camp I've watched or preseason, the ability to handle the way Horton Tucker does. Like, I don't think you can put Abaji at the top of the key, run him a pick and roll and let him go yet. I'm not, maybe I'm wrong. Um, I haven't watched all the practice, but from the tape I watched at Kansas, which was about five games, and watching training camp, I have not seen that skill yet. So I see him more right now as a 3 and D attack closeout guy, not an initiator guy. I think that's important. We're seeing us, particularly with Sexton, on the floor, use Horton Tucker a lot as a ball handler. Sexton is just not a natural point guard. And so you need somebody else on the floor to complement Sexton. And Abaji, I'm not sure it does that. So that's part of it. Overall this year, I'm like, if Foncecchio doesn't get back into the rotation, um, I don't think he will, frankly. I could be totally wrong. I don't know how Will Hardy works, but I would be surprised if Foncecchio is in the rotation on Wednesday. Um, I don't think a back end of a back-to-back where everyone's sluggish is a day you change the rotation even as well as Foncecchio played. I think you're going to see Will give guys 10, 12, 13, 15 game stretches. If they're not playing well after that, and then it's clear, try the next guy is the way I would see it. So... I, at this point, quite honestly, Abaji is going to get time in the G League. Abaji is going to get time in practices. Those are going to be the important minutes for Abaji. Whether he gets time or not is probably going to be whether we make roster moves or whether or not there's guys that don't perform. If we keep playing like we're playing right now, he's probably not going to play very much on the NBA level because those guys are playing great. So that's the truth, is that's the way this thing um, is going to work, is that those guys are getting the first shot. And they're not going to, if they go 0 for 7, they're not getting pulled. They go 10 for 70 over a 10 game stretch. Okay, we probably got to make a move. And then you get the next guy in. Um, rookies are almost never good their first year. Now, last year's rookie class was a little better. And this year's one is indicating to be pretty good as well. But rookies are usually bad, quite honestly. So, Abaji needs time to develop, but he can get a lot of that in the G League. He can get some of that as the NBA season goes on. You're going to hope he gets enough minutes. It might actually be even more important for Francesco to get enough minutes this season so that you know really how you feel about him as a player and how he fits into the NBA than it is to get Abaji minutes from a franchise development standpoint. 
All right, adding layers is going to be my reoccurring theme for the entire year because that's really where we are as a franchise. And Lowry Markkinen is adding the layer this year of what it's like to be the best player on a team. And the layer yesterday, the layer yesterday was, oh my gosh, it's exhausting. You know, he's 25 years old. He's got great experience for a 25-year-old. We've talked about this a lot, that the second year in the league, they gave him the ball a ton, then they never let him develop. I look forward to talking to him about this. And now this is his chance. We're, we're going we're gonna to run plays for him. We're going to unleash him. He is going to be the primary offensive player along with Jordan. How does he deal with it? Night in and night out. And what we saw last night was a Lowry Mar- Markkinen whose body was not working with his brain at all. But I also thought we saw some fun development. So he doesn't have the three and he knows it, right? Like it's obvious to him. It is not falling at all on a Monday night in Houston after a double overtime game and 31 the night before. And so if you go by and you look at his first quarter, and you know, this is one of the things I said early in the year. I love the fact he took five shots. One of the layers for him is taking five shots. He went one for five, oh for three from three in the first quarter. Fine, I don't care. Second quarter, he takes another five shots. This is great. He's understanding his role and doing it. He goes two of five. And so in the first half, Markinen is is struggling and is doesn't have it. And he's three of ten, oh five from three. And then we watch him change his game a little bit. He doesn't have a greatly different game. But if you kind of look at what he, his shots that he took in the third quarter, he's now driving to the basket. He's now trying to get inside. He's he only takes one really, really outside good. shot. He plays out of a post up. His five is six shots are all at the rim trying to work it. We're, we saw him actually in the middle of a night try to add and change his game and use his remarkable versatility to become a more efficient player. And then in the third quarter, he goes two of three, does not take an outside shot. Um, again, and... His second half shot chart is completely in around the basket. He takes one outside shot and everything else is at the rim. I love that. That's the layers I'm talking about. I think that's a successful night. You look at Lowry Markinen and you might look at him and say, oh my gosh, she, he's not that. He went 7 of 19, 0 of 6 and 3, only scored 14 points. And you know what? You're right. He's not a top 10, 12 player in the NBA who can handle the burden of scoring 20 points every single night yet. That's brutally hard. And he's got to learn that. But I love what I saw out of him last night. In that, he, as the night went on, he altered his game. He understood it. He tried to figure it out. Like, how do I play tired? He was exhausted. He was talking after the game about how tired that he was that he was worked. Like, okay. Like, that's great. Because that's the burden we're asking you to take to see if you can add that as a layer to see whether or not this is something you can do. Is he a number one guy for a great team? Probably not. Is he a number two or three? Maybe. Maybe. I think the same thing with Colin Sexton. Like, Colin Sexton played 16 minutes last night, and as I said, I think they curtails him. He is just an unbelievably great rebounder. He is an unbelievably great rebounder. And he plays with amazing tempo, and he's crazy fast. And he just doesn't, like, see passing lanes at all. Okay, so let's try to work on it without turning it over. There was a preseason game where he just came out and passed every single time. That's the layer he needs to add to his game. When... Sexton's on the floor and you get into a half-court set and suddenly he's playing with Malik Beasley, who's 5 of 9, had 12 points last night. Suddenly Malik Beasley has to be one who is making plays off the bounce. That is not his natural game at all. All of our guys are being taxed a little bit more than their natural where they are right now and where they've been typecasted in their career. So what's the layer that they can add to it? Pretty cool. Pretty cool to see. And Beasley last night tried it a bunch of times. Not sure. He made two great steals defensively. Loved that and showed that kind of development um, last night and really did a wonderful job of that. And I got to tell you, Taylor Horton Tucker is one of the most interesting players I've ever seen. He was three of seven last night from the field. One of three from three. Had five rebounds, three assists, two blocks, and a steal in 17 minutes. The five rebounds, the three assists, the one steal, the two blocks... All in 17 minutes, and seven shots in 17 minutes. It's amazing. And for a guy I'm saying is not passing, you know, frankly, had three assists. For my fullback, gave up the ball. He has to play off contact. It's pretty interesting. But he's a just completely unconventional, unnatural player for me. And I, I'm not sure I quite understand it. And I, and I have to probably learn it a little bit. So it'll be interesting. 
Um, all right, let me get back to some of the questions and all of that and, and get your thoughts on that as we continue. Again, for your second listen today, I know the thing says NBA Big Board, but I'm telling you, Locked on Sports Today is your second listen. Really excited to have you um, tune in, hear that show, and tell me what you think of it. Um, you can get it at Locked on Sports Today. It's available um, wherever you get your podcast. also available on YouTube for you. Um, so really want you to check that program out. Okay, I want to get to your questions today on a live edition. We don't do it uh, very often. I thought Foncheckio was great last night. It was really neat. You saw all the strengths. I thought he attacked, the best part of it was he attacked the closeout beautifully. He made a beautiful pass. Um, we know he can shoot. And so he showed uh, that ability to be able to do that. Uh, really wide base, high release, good size, can always get that shot off. Uh, it was a super, super change of pace to the game. I thought that's really revealing about Will Hardy last night too. That Will Hardy is sitting out here, you know, willing to go to, um, you know, I, willing to go to anyone on the bench. Um, he went to Nikhil Alexander Walker in place of um, Colin Sexton. I thought he went to Simone Foncecchio in place of Malik Beasley. Rudy Gay did not have it last night either, and so Rudy Gay was kind of out of the rotation. And Walker Kessler didn't have it last night as he was just using his hands on picks and getting called for it by uh, Brent Barnicky on just about every single time. So I'm not sure. It was more, I think, of just trying to find a spark, right? It was because um, Foncecchio and Rudy Gay play together to start. Um, when Foncecchio comes in, it's because Kessler goes out and they throw Rudy Gay to the center position for that end of the third quarter period of time because Kessler just doesn't, quite have it. Then Vanderbilt comes back in at the center to start the fourth quarter and Alexander Walker comes in for Sexton, but Foncecchio stays. So now at that point, Foncecchio is playing, I guess you could say Rudy Gay's power forward minutes with Alexander Walker, Horton Tucker at the three and Beasley at the two, maybe. Then Mike Jordan Clarkson comes in for Beasley Conley comes in for Alexander Walker and marketing comes in for Horton Tucker. So now Funchecki is playing Kelly Linux minutes at the four. And then Kelly Linux checks in for Vanderbilt and goes to the five. And Funchecki is probably sliding to the three as marketing slides to the four. And this is the versatility that we're hearing from Will Hardy about how this roster works. So um, I think that's a little bit of, of what you're seeing there. Kind of that. So um Sweet. Thamor says, I think the attitude was with Rudy Gay, that how it seemed to me, but now in real games, he does look better with his haircut. Maybe he has new resolve. He did get his haircut. He cut off his options. Um, so I, I, Rudy Gay's, you know, last night, I think he was tired, right? Like he just, the, Rudy Gay's at an age now where the body plays some nights and the body doesn't play on other nights. Um, and so last night, I think was a night where the body wasn't playing. Uh, Bolsey88 says, not just joining, but not sure if you discussed Kelly Olenek. He's one of our best plus minus. Why did you why did they not utilize him more down the stretch? I think he played the final five. Um, so here was the story I want to tell about Kelly Olenek. So I was talking to Kelly last night in the locker room before the game, and he had played in Houston. And he played in Houston at the end of the COVID season. They had no players, and he they turned it over to him and let him really go to work. And I asked him what it, you know, how was that? And he said it was just the most rewarding period of time of his career. He just it, it brought back a, a joy of basketball for him, um, and he just loved it. And he said, you know, hey, I was on great teams, right? He says, I've been to an NBA Finals. I've been to two conference finals. And, and, and that's great, but I was just playing a role. Um, and I don't, you know, he's like, I don't mind playing a role, but that's, you know, let's be honest. That's, that's what I was doing. So he goes to Eastern Conference Finals in Boston in 2017. He goes to, East, he goes to the NBA Finals in 2020 with Miami. Um, that's in the bubble and, um, you know, he, and he goes to the Eastern, I guess he's been to one Eastern conference final and, and one, uh, two Eastern conference finals, one with Miami, one with Boston. He says, Hey, those are great, but like, I'm just playing a role. Right. And if you go back and look in the four game series, uh, in the six game series against Boston, he only plays four of them. He plays 40 minutes. And in the five game series against Milwaukee in the Eastern conference semifinals, he plays, you know, 12 minutes a night. Um, his most minutes he's ever played was Eastern conference finals for my, or Eastern Conference playoffs for Miami, played 29. But right, so like his minutes played for all these really, really good teams, which are these great experiences, were 10, 12, 13, 18, 19 in, in the overtimes. So he goes to Houston 
for this little tiny stretch of basketball that he got to play in Houston for 27 day games, and he played 31 minutes a night. During the regular season, he's played at times as much as 23 in Miami, um, but he played 31 minutes a night for 27 games in Houston. He said it was just great. Like, he started, he averaged 19 points, 8 rebounds, 4 assists. Steele, he says it just brought back a zest and a joy in the game that he had just, you know, he didn't want to say he'd lost, but he's like, it's great playing on these good teams, but it's hard. Right? You just can only play a role and you have to kind of limit yourself to that role. And he says, I got to Houston, I got to just play. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that version of Kelly Olynyk. If you actually go back, that's 2021. Last year in 21-22, he goes to Detroit. He plays just 40 games He um, in that season and he doesn't, you know, we're now, he's back to start. He didn't start, so he came off the bench. And if you look, he starts the year early in the season. He plays the first 10 games of the year, and he's coming off the bench, but he's playing 23 minutes a night, and he averages 13 points, 5 rebounds, and 2 assists. So that's the same guy that kind of was unleashed in Houston, using all of his skills, opening up his game, and and gets and does his work. Then he gets inactive for a long time. He doesn't really come back until February. And then he plays a much more limited role on that team. They've kind of moved on. He doesn't get more than 20 minutes a night again. And now we're getting... So I think we're getting this kind of unique Kelly Olynyk player at 31 years old who has come off this Houston experience of getting twenty this starting role in, in this major moments and having to expand his game and bring a joy to the game back to him. And now we're kind of back turning him over to that role. And he and he's really, really jumping all over it. And we're getting a better player because of it. So that's that's what I wanted to share with you about Kelly. I love these chances to go back in the locker room and talk to players. I had a fun conversation with Walker Kessler the other night about his recruitment. I was like, did you do the hats? He's like, I totally wanted to. My parents would have killed me. So that's not who we are. He's like, I would have had fun with that. You bet Walker Kessler would have had fun with that. And I got a chance to talk to Abaji um, with Kelly yesterday. It was great. Some of these conversations, you know, pieces of it I'm always going to keep to myself and not share just because I think they're off the record. We were just talking about the rest of the league and what you're seeing in teams and how players interact and things like that. And then, you know, then on Kelly, really serious questions about that final play and about that um, and his time in Houston. So hopefully interesting um, for you to get to hear those kind of stories and all of that. All right, uh, we'll talk a little bit. Will Hardy's super interesting about environment. We'll have that for you tomorrow. Um, let me just check and make sure I'm not missing um, Conley Gay Clarkson for Westbrook. I mean, it's a really interesting conversation um, of what the Jazz do. If, if the Lakers put the 17th and 19th first round picks back on the board and they decide that's the spot to go rather than uh, Buddy Heald and Miles Turner. What do you do um, if you're the Utah Jazz in long-term planning, particularly considering how wonderful this start has been? It's a really, it's an interesting question, but the Lakers are in a real bind right now. And I think it's going to be super interesting um, to see. I just checked our numbers on the show. It's really good. So thank you very much for listening. Um, Appreciate it. Um, Ma La, to wrap it up, said, would like to see marketing get that short-range jumper in the paint more often, drive to the hoop, then pull up and let the defense fly. Kind of like how Quinn used... Uh, Gordon Hayward later on. So I want to just give you credit. I don't know who you are. Um, so I 100% had the same thought. I'm just going to share that. Like, And I'm a little reluctant um, to kind of share those things right now because I don't want to sound like I'm coaching with new coaching staff and acting like that. I knew the other coaching staff so well. If I made comments like that, I kind of knew where they were. Um, there's probably a reason we don't run it, but that little loop play that we ran with the where Hayward came from the baseline, got the handoff, and came back the other way for Markinen, um that gets him into the paint seems like a, something that could be instituted at some point in the season um, and would be pretty neat. I also think it'd be really neat with a Linux because um, you're doing it with a Linux if they overplay the switch, a Linux turns the corner and drives. Um, or even Vando. Um, so I think that's a pretty interesting idea. My lock. Tip of the hat to you. Great comment. All right, that wraps us up. That is the Locked On Jazz Live edition today. Hope you're good. We'll, we'll we come back on, we, like I got home at 2.45 last night and I'm trying to be really, really diligent about going to the gym because I'm old um, and ski season is coming and I'm trying to stay fit. So I'm getting up and going right to the gym on those days and then I'll come back and do the show. So we'll probably do some more live shows during the day um, uh, kind of on when we come back from road trips like this. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Talk to you soon.